We will come back here until we're on board. <laughs> and it's really interesting. It's an interesting country. I don't have my pointer, but right here at 3 o'clock, you can see two bare areas here on the mountain. That's called Steve Goat Mountain. And that's a very interesting mountain for me. And I'll just take a minute to share a, a humorous story. And, and you'll understand why I appreciate it. Before they built the new Alcan, uh, the old highway was all dirt. When I drove it back from late 75 through 77, uh, it was all dirt, 1,202 miles of dirt and gravel and mud. And in the summertime, they'd spray calcium chloride on it to keep the dust down because it gets so bad with all the freight trucks. And when it would rain on that calcium chloride, it would turn it to grease. And so there were times when in the middle of the summer, in a rainstorm, I'd have to pull over and chain up my truck to get up the hills or down the hills. When I was trucking on this Alcan uh, Highway, most of the time I was hauling explosives. Uh, class A explosives, and sometimes Class B. Well, what's the difference between Class A and Class B? Well, Class B takes something to ignite it, and Class A doesn't. Class A is the nitro, and Class B is the powder. Well, on my semi, I had a box behind the sleeper that we referred to as a drum box. And that's where we would put the Class A explosive, the nitro, for igniting the Class B, which is in the 45-foot reaper behind. When I took on the contract to haul on this highway from Linden, Washington to Beaver Creek, Alaska, now 1202, I signed a contract to run sleeper team, meaning two drivers, because the company I was leased to wanted you to make a turn in four and a half days. So it was a 4,700 mile round trip in four and a half days with a semi, with 2,200 miles of that being dirt and mud. And so when I went with my first driver, it was a horrible experience because when I was laying in the sleeper, I couldn't sleep because I'd lay there and I'd listen to the engine. I'd hear the transmission, the differentials, and the tires, and I would hear him miss a gear, and I'd hmm, that's my transmission. And I would just get so upset. And so I found ways of getting rid of my drivers. And one trip up, I had was dispatched out with the load of Class A explosives, and it was in the drum box, and Class B in the back. And we were actually going down the hill into what's called Prince George in Central BC, and this driver said, well, Gary, why did they put the Class A explosive in the drum box right behind the cab? And I said, well, there's a very specific reason for that. And he said, why? And I said, that's if we hit another truck or we run off the road and hit something, it will ignite the Class A explosive, and it will blow the cab off the truck, but it won't hurt the payload in the trailer. I pulled into Prince George to fuel up, and I never saw him again. <laughs> so that worked quite well. And the, another driver I got rid of, it happened here on Steamboat Mountain. He was kind of a lazy character, and, and he didn't even want to wake up when I'd pull off the chain up. And he'd just stay in a sleeper and sleep, and it made me really angry. And it was in October, and it was snowing and sleeting, and just it was a slick, muddy mess. And pulling steamboat, there were five switchbacks getting up onto the top. And so I pulled over, chained up. He wouldn't get out of the sleeper, and I thought, oh, well, I can put the chains on quicker without him anyway. Got back in the truck, and I was starting to feel angry that he was just laying there snoring and then bawling him a bit. And I start up the mountain. But what really made this a special experience was the day before. I was in, the, in Linden, and we were at the yard switching our, our, our trailers, and I was waiting for my dispatch. And I was walking around, just kind of looking at things and killing a little time, and I walked past the boneyard of this trucking company, Linden Transport, and here was a steering wheel from an old Peterbilt that had been wrecked laying in the boneyard. And I looked down and I thought, golly, my boys would love playing with that. So I picked it up, walked into the shop, and I asked the head shop mechanic, I said, hey, how much for this steering wheel? He says, are you kidding? You want it? You're happy. We're happy for you to take it out of the junkyard. So I walked over and opened my door, and I just reached up and slid it behind my seat because it was too big to go under the sleeper in the tool compartment. Well, I'm pulling this mountain now, and it is middle of the night 
one, two o'clock in the morning and raining and snowing, and the higher I go, the more the snow is coming, and I'm spinning and slipping in the mud, and at that time I was pulling a four axle drop center low bed with a D9 side boom pipe layer and 144,000 gross, and it was slow going. And I just, it just, you know, I started feeling this anger, and I said, I just, I can't do this. And then I got this little idea that came in my mind. And as I rounded the second switch back, and I'm down in third gear now, climbing for the third one, I reached back behind my seat, and I pulled that steering wheel out, and I looked at it, and I couldn't help myself. I pulled the curtain back, and I threw it in, and I said, Richard, help! <laughs> well, the steering wheel hit him in the chest. He came up with it on both hands. He came out through the sleeper, across the jump seat, and was going out the door when I grabbed his belt and pulled him back in. And I was laughing so hard, I almost spun out on the third switchback. And I laughed until we climbed to the top as he sat in that seat, cursing me. I pulled into Watson Lake, the scales, and he jumped out. I never saw him again. <laughs> so anyway, I went through four drivers and finally the company said, Gary, I said, listen, Carl, he was the dispatcher. I said, I cannot drive with a second driver. Simple as that. I said, just let me drive and you won't have any problems. He says, you have to make a round in four and a half days. I drove that road every week for seven straight months and never missed a single trip in that time. And my average downtime was two hours and 45 minutes in 24, and that included fueling time. And so I, I told many people it took me over two years to see the entire length of that whole road because I drove so much of it in my sleep. So it was, it was interesting. I was coming back one time with a, an empty trailer and I had another trailer decked on top because the, the tractor had wrecked and rolled over and I picked up the trailer to take it back. And I hit a straight stretch just out of what's called 101 north of Fort St. John. And I was booting it pretty good at 60, 65 miles an hour on this dirt road. Pitch black, middle of the night, you know, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. And boom! The front steer tire blew. And back in those days, we had what was called snap rims on the tires. And that snap rim went right through the front fender and cut all the wiring. And it was solid pitch black with no lights at 65 miles an hour on a dirt road. And so I was put on the Johnny brake, pulling on the trailer, stepping on the brake, letting it ride on the jake, pulling the gears down, and I'd start to go into the ditch on this side, and I could feel it dive, and I'd steer it until it started to go in the ditch on this side, and steer it back on this side, until I finally got it stopped sideways. But it was just a lot of... Interesting experiences. <laughs> And a lot of them I hadn't thought about until I landed in Port Nelson a little over two and a half months ago when I went to look at the land the first time. And when I drove into Port Nelson, I hadn't been there since 1977. I was absolutely shocked. I knew we were in the wrong town because when I was there the last time, they only had a dirt runway uh, for bush planes. And now it's a great big commercial airport for jets because they're flying people now into the oil fields in the north. And, and I drive into Port Nelson and I'm in shock because here's this paved road that was just a little goat trail that two semis would have a difficult time passing on. There were no stop signs or stop lights in Port In fact, there wasn't even a stop sign in Port Nelson. And if you blinked your eyes, you would not know you'd gone through a town. And now it's got three, three, three traffic lights. It was so amazingly different. It was, a, it was just awesome. But anyway, this is just a view of the country. But uh, this, that is the black spruce. And it's very easy to identify it because you look at the top of the tree. And you see the little tuft at the tops? That's indigenous and typical characteristic of black spruce, totally unlike any of the other spruce, pine, fir, conifer type trees. And so uh, this is part of the road just south, about 30 miles south of Fort Nelson, uh, going into Fort Nelson, uh, just out of, and Ben and Carol would know this because they lived there for quite some time, six years, Ben. 
And uh, he built houses there during the boom days, all three of them. And, <laughs> but uh, this is out by Prophet River. And uh, just, you know, just so you see some of the scenery. But all the timber you see on both sides of the highway that's dark there, that's primary black spruce. There's three uh, basic indigenous conifers there. You got black spruce, white spruce, and tamarack, and a few pine. But the majority <coughs> is black spruce. Uh, here you're looking at black, almost 100% black spruce, except the tamarack, the taller one right there in the, in the middle of the screen, and then over on the, on the right side there, and that's tamarack. This is the first aerial inspection I did of the farm, 286 acres. And of course, it is now the Young Living Farm. And if you, if you look right here where the black line turns at the edge of the timber, and then you go back up about your hand width, you'll see kind of a, a bare area right there. That's where we came through the gate to start the entrance way into the farm. Uh, to start developing the distillery and the project, uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what it looked like. Because it does not look like that in that area any longer. Now, this 145 acres is a new addition that we have just filed on. We purchased the 286 and then we filed on a lease from the government for this 145 acres, which uh, they told us it'd take about four months to get it processed through the Crown, and that will be Young Living. Now, once we clear it and develop it, then we can purchase the deed to it. So, uh, we've got a beautiful future there. Fort Nelson has a microclimate that is very unusual because uh, people here do grow tomatoes. They start them in the greenhouse and set them out, but I, I saw tomatoes in gardens up there the first of January. It was almost as tall as this cabinet, loaded with tomatoes in the garden. Uh, right now our friend Danny and, and his wife Eva are just waiting for their second crop of corn to mature. And you, you ask yourself, how can this be possible? Well, when I was there the 5th of June, the sun set at 11.35 and it came up at 2.30. So, and 6 o'clock is the hottest time of the day during those summer hours because that's the peak time. When you're feeling like unwinding, look at your clock because it'll surprise you. It'll be 10 o'clock and the sun is still in the sky. So, but however, it changes quickly. When we left last Tuesday morning, the sun was now setting at 9 o'clock uh, and coming up at 4.45. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, on the farm, the property. It's all uh, woody and brushy. Uh, a lot of water. When I was looking for water, I had a little uh, caterpillar that I rented to try and find high ground to build on and I was driving all through the place and making little trails and checking for water and looking for the ground conditions and I almost lost the cat in the spring. Uh, one of the meadows and there you see all the black spruce there in the background. It's all around. This is what happened when I was trying to push the brush out of the way and back up and anyway. Uh, that was a four hour relay, but it really doesn't take long to put a track back on a cat because it just takes two guys. One on the front of the track and one on the back of the track, and you just both pull really hard and stretch it out and just slide it back. <laughs> Not quite. But anyway, after the first day, I thought, well, I've got to get some more help. So I rented a bigger machine, a D6, and we were unloading here, taking it onto the property. Then I rented this excavator with the brush blade clearing the land. And, and then the project begins. That's myself on the cat there as I'm clearing the site for the distillery. Here I was digging in an area looking for the possible place to build a reservoir. And this is where I started uh, outlining the reservoir. Uh, these were curious visitors that came to check us out, and it was very interesting watching them. So this is on the site, how it looked before we started. Um, just a lot of brush and some open here areas. We started pushing off the top soil. That was Mark, um, and I thought he would be here, but he's supposed to arrive today. He's my pilot, and it was very interesting because 
when we got there, Mark said to me, he says, well, Gary, how can I help you? And I said, well, Mark, what would you like to do? And he says, I'll do anything. And I said, have you ever run an excavator? And he said, no. But he says, I, I would like to learn. So I put him on the excavator, and that's where he started, right there. And it was amazing because two days later, one of the contractors, I read a piece of equipment, came out to the site to see how things were going. And he was watching Mark operate the excavator, and he said, wow, where did you get that operator? And I said, I flew him in. <laughs> and he said, really, where from? And I said, Florida. <laughs> and I said, he said, well, he's good. And I said, yeah, he's had quite a bit of experience, really. And I said, yeah, he started yesterday morning. <laughs> and he just, he says, you're kidding. And I said, no. And he said, I'd hire him any day. So he took to it like a duck takes the water, and it was really good. Here I was clearing the site for the distillery to get all the topsoil scraped off, get down to good uh, material, get all the organic off, and uh, started surveying the area, laying it out. Now this was breakfast. I cooked for the guys every morning but one, because uh, I had to get some blueprints into the planning commission, and so I worked all night in the morning to get them finished, to get them in, and so the guys ate. Actually, they, I don't think they ate that morning, did you? <laughs> Chip grins. Well, we made it in the town, but anyway. So we had breakfast every morning. Uh, I heard one of the guys say, "Whew, I, I think I've gained weight." But I believe in feeding my guys well. They work hard. They deserve good food. Uh, this was Mark digging there, and uh, as we start excavating for the distillery site, uh, their ship on his excavator. And there's Scott on the front end loader. And uh, there's Gary and Jake. Joseph was in training. And there's Jacob. He operated the vibrator compactor. Him and Jake and Joseph took turns. Between that and the excavator and the D6, they had a lot of the D5, they had a lot of fun. There's Mark on his excavator. Uh, Jim, he took over the truck uh, because he was the only one with the CDL besides myself. And, and he is the one that was hauling off the steep mountain. And it was steep, and it was it was a thrill. The first time he came off the mountain, um, and I asked him how things were going, he didn't even answer me. He just nodded his head, and it was all white. You know? uh, but I said, okay, he's, he's still breathing. So. Uh, this was Mary and the boys' favorite pastime, was eating the wild raspberries when they come out to the side. They're all over the farm. And I, I kid you not, it was... Uh, Every time you got off the machine, you'd want to run over and, and have a little snack. Uh, this was part of the operation here, just building the sites. Uh, there's Joseph on the vibrator compactor, uh, the buffalo herd. There's Joseph on the excavator. Jacob. Or Jacob. Uh, Jacob on the excavator. He would trade off with Scott or Chip. Uh, Chip and Jacob would trade back and forth from the D6 to the excavator. And then when Chip left, Jacob had to assume the role. Uh, you can see the guys really like private transportation. Uh, so the girls, you might have a little problem with them, you know, and then now it's, they kind of took to this. And uh, it was fun. There's our, our crew there uh, the, the day before the, we flew out or they flew home. Uh, there's Chip working, packing. The, this is the pad site for the truck bay where the trucks will back in to unload. Uh, this was at 9.40 at night uh, when we were working and, and Scott turned the lights on his loader there. I don't know why I wanted to see if they worked because I never saw the lights come on when we were working because it was always too daylight. But that was 9.40 at night and the sun was just setting and you can see the light through the trees. Uh, so you get a lot done. Here's the construction crew. The truck on the far left there, that was a rented truck. And the basement there, you know, people ask what we're building. I said, swimming pool, the big size, so we can enjoy it. And, uh, that's Chip on the D6, Jacob on the excavator in the back. And uh, the crew there, uh, in the back there is the pad site for the recycling, chip recycling plant, where we're building a dryer and a pelleting plant. So our chips will have full um, recycling, drying the chips, and then putting into the pump machine. I've had four or five different people approach me about wanting to sign a contract for the pellets. The oil camps burn pellets in the stoves in the oil camps, and they're after me for the chips or the pellets for that. So we've already got a, a nice source. 
which I'm sure that Kevin, our CFO, will be really happy to know that uh, that'll pay for the whole operation. Uh, Joseph been training on the on the D5, which she took over and did a great job. And there he is on the excavator after Scott and Chip went home. And I think he liked the excavator better. He stayed on it longer. He felt he had better control of it. Just did a great job. There's no Mickey Mouse to talk about. <laughs> well, quite how she acquired the ears, I'm not sure, but anyway, it's a place that that's good. Uh, there's Jacob on the D D5. Uh, Mary and I were both just absolutely impressed because all the years Jacob never showed an interest on the cats or the dozers. He's always taken to the backhoes and the skidsters and the excavators. And he came over and he said, Dad, could I run the D5 for a while? And I said, sure. And so I put him on it and was just absolutely shocked at how he just has a natural talent. And he was moving dirt and pushing on the roads and had control of that blade just like he'd been doing it forever. Uh, this is the core drilling people that finally showed up 10 days late. Uh, they drilled 31 feet to get core samples so they could study the dirt. So contractors that know how much cement and rebar needs to go in the forms or in the footings. And uh, also the structural people that know the support places and how close they need to set the structural beams and that to carry the support. So they went down 31 feet and the reason they stopped drilling 31 feet is because the China People were waving to them. <laughs> they hit water and uh, stopped drilling. So this is the site from the air after the first week of work. Uh, this was even before the path for the recycling plant was excavated. And there you can see the dugout for the distillery and the path. Uh, the arrow that is also there by itself, that's where the distributor lodge. And, um, as it is called conference center. Because when I turned my original plans into the city, they want to know what was going to be built there. And I said, well, we're going to have a pellet plant, we're going to have a camp, and we're going to have a spa. And they just, I watched the body of mine just go. <laughs> so, you know, in the conversation later, they, and oh, and a reservoir. And so in the conversation later, I started talking and they said, well, we're not really in favor of having a camp because we deal with oil field camps up here and we don't really want to see that, particularly close to the highway. So I showed them pictures of the camp in, in Highland and the lodge in St. Mary. They, oh, well, this is different. Mr. Young, just don't call it a camp. Call it a lodge and a conference center, and you're OK with that. And don't call it a reservoir, but if you call it a dugout, we don't have a problem with that. And don't call it a pellet plant, because we don't take too kindly to pellet plants because they cause a lot of pollution. Just call it a chip recycling plant. We're okay with that. So it's all about terminology. And uh, here's a picture I took uh, four days before leaving from the air. And you can see the two gray areas there on uh, your left side of the screen. Uh, one is a distillery pad and the other is a chip recycling plant. And then the larger clearing area is where the lodge and the conference center are going in. And then further down is the dugout for the water for the distillery. All this area here now directly to our bottom that's more open. We've got machines in there now. They're supposed to be, actually no, today's Sunday. Monday that will start uh, clearing that out. My goal is to have the distillery up by the 1st of October in an operation. But I'm really thrilled to tell you that I'm going to be ahead of schedule because I promise that we will be distilling black spruce by October the 1st. And I can tell you today that it will not happen. It's going to happen on August the 27th. Wow. So, I'm going to get black spruce, so I'm taking a distillery in the airplane back with me. So, uh, anyway, that's our project. The next larger stand of trees over, uh, looking up to the upper part of the photo, that's where I uh, determined to put the uh, RV campground. We have one mile, that's the Alaska Highway there, we have one mile of this uh, highway. Uh, and so there's over a thousand uh, people a day during the heat of the summer. <laughs> that travel, I'm sorry, 1,000 people a week that travel average, that travel this highway from May 1st to October 1st. 
And the campground to the north of us, 22 miles, has an average of 300 overnight stays. And there's not enough room for the people to camp. And so we'll be building a spa here. It's all designed and ready to go. We're just waiting for the architect to put his stamp on it. And we're set to go. So when we get back, we start putting in forms and footings. And I'm really excited about it. I'm excited for all of the people in Canada that will have their own Mecca now that their distributors can come to. But this is, I believe, and I've made the statement, will become a hallmark place for young living in the future because this will operate probably 12 months out of the year just like Ecuador. Uh, the distillation will take place from 1st of March, mid-February to 1st of March to November to the 1st of December. December, January, and February are the coldest ones there that can get down to a breezy 40 below zero. Mm -hmm. And there's been times in the old days when I lived there, it got colder. But after Ben Carroll lived up there, they did some, some weather dances and they changed the weather while they were there because Carroll doesn't like the cold. And now it's a lot warmer. So, you know, Ben would go out and work in his shirt sleeves at 40 below now. Uh, but it, it's, it has, just like our weather's changed all over the planet, but it has moderated. And, but what we will be doing during those three months, December, January, February, uh, we'll be running the dryer and the pelleting plant so our employees have year-round work. But because it is kind of a romantic area, Fort Nelson, it's got a lot of history to it as well. Um, and the Alaska Highway being a very interesting place, there's uh, the Laird Hot Springs just to the north of it that is absolutely breathtaking and stunning, one of the highlights in North America for natural hot water. And wintertime is, is just absolutely the most beautiful thing you can imagine. Because I've been there in the winter and all the steam coming off the hot water just creates prisms and rainbows when the sun is shining. And then they illuminate off the icicles hanging off the trees around the hot water. And it is a magical place. So a lot of great things. But we are building a visitor center here, and uh, so people up and down the all can will be able to stop and learn about oils, and stop in, have a, have a treatment to spa, and classes and that. We're building a large uh, conference room up on the second floor of the lodge that will hold over 150 people at a time. Uh, actually, there's no, it'll be more than that, it'll be closer to 350 people. So there'll be room for conferences and, and meetings and training and that. So it'll be a, a, a great opportunity. We're going to be growing here uh, Leadum, Yarrow, Kaniza, and Goldenrod to start with. And that's my goal to get those crops planted this fall before freeze up so we've got our crops for next year's harvest. So it's a big project and a big push, uh, but this is only one of them because we are also, I've just uh, this week shipped two distilleries to Peru. And next week, those two distilleries are in operation in Peru, distilling rosewood. I don't know if you saw it, Travis, I forwarded to you, that the government has approved for our CITES permit, and we will have it by the 15th of September for shipping, exporting rosewood. And Young Living will be the only company in the world today with a, site, a legal CITES permit from the government. So a lot of wonderful things are being accomplished. The road will be finished by the end of October into the farm property. And so right now we're renting property outside the farm for setting up the distillery so we can go forward and keeping that production going. So uh, a lot to do to help protect and create that for the future that you and we need to supply you with that which what you desire. So it's been an interesting time. I've got to show you this little video clip that it will open. Um, you'll, whoops. It's, hmm. come on the screen. I guess I won't. Uh, Rick's not here. And I don't know how to get it on the screen. Rick, here you can help. Try it again. No? didn't work, so we'll try to Ah, oh, there we go. A trick to Travis talking. 
Uh, the only thing in, oh, there we go. Oh, okay. When we were looking for water and a dry place to uh, build the distillery, this is the thing is everywhere, everywhere I went with the little cap, there was this water and soft ground and springs. And so I found this one area that looked fairly good. So I pushed the timber out and cleared it off enough to get the excavator in. I said, Mark, go ahead and dig here so we can see if, if the ground is solid enough we can build. So he dug down and only came to get me to let me know he'd gone down 15 feet and there was no water, it was a dry hole. And so I went back with him looking at it. We're standing there looking at it. Wow, this is great. Maybe I'd better go get the cat and come back and start opening it up a little more. And as we were talking about it, and I started to walk away to go get the cat, we heard this and it sounded like a semi-truck tire blowing out. And we turned around to see what the noise was. And it shot across the hole and then just started pouring out. And I got my camera there, um, but a little bit of time to catch the big first. But it's an artesian. And it was four feet below the surface. Wow. And by nighttime, it was full. That 15-foot hole was completely full of water. The next morning, it was running down through the trees. <laughs> So we know that we've got good water supply, even if we have to pipe it. Uh, but that was interesting. So some some fun things. That, uh, anyway, that's the report. We can turn the lights back on about Fort Nelson just to give you an update there. Uh, and I. I come to give you the okay. So now take a look to the right, you're going to see the port of Fontier. There's a sign that says we're changing country. And you see the two policemen. So they are policemen in Monaco, but they are French citizens. Un policier pour sept habitants. Ah bon? Pour trois habitants. Pas que ça? Un policier pour trois habitants. There's a, a, a policeman to, uh, uh, to uh, three uh, uh, inhabitants. Wow. Every three inhabitants. So now we're in Monaco. So you see, so you see, so you know, uh, there's a big change. <laughs> so now let me tell you that even uh, even cows here in Monaco are different from uh, any other uh, cows in the world. Well, they they carry some milk. Right, one, 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 one cow from Monaco. <laughs> and you can have three wheels. Three wheels. Three wheels. Three wheels. Different cow. from uh, the cows in France or anywhere else. So this is the in. So now we're going to to uh, we're going to stop at first in the old section. Wow. We're, we're going to see from outside the Princess Palace, the uh, the aquarium, and uh, possibly inside we can go and see the church in order to see the tombs where all the princes and the uh, princes of Monaco are buried. At uh, the bottom of the old section, you can see now the walls surrounding the old section. The round tower called as Tour de Serraval, or the Serravalle Tower. The name is Italian, Serravalle Tower. We are going now to drive under the, uh, uh, the, the old section. We are also going to uh, see part of the Grand Prix circuits. Entirely located within Monaco. With it. I'm going to show you now, uh, to show you now where uh, the poor people here in Monaco live. Uh, they cannot afford to buy an apartment and they have to live on the water here in the port, see? So these are ugly boats for poor people. <laughs> Low building. There's a row, uh, a curve that goes, you know, a road that goes around the building and a curve. The second most dangerous curve of the whole circuit called the Tournant de la Rascasse, the scorpion fish curve, due to the fact that the restaurant is called the scorpion fish. Now we're going to stop in the old section, right to the port of Monaco. Upon that, this it's a four-star hotel, very comfortable, personalized service. You can uh, choose your food and uh, and everything. 
The only one thing missing in this uh, hotel is the key to leave the room. And that you uh, have a holiday that will be minus one or minus two. Okay, and we need to uh, go on walking. So it's going to be a walking tour. We're going to go slowly enough, you know. The party will be in approximately one hour. So now we, uh, they decided to, uh, oh, to split uh, from Monaco, you know. And they joined up with uh, Bidmans for a few years. And after in 1861, they joined up with uh, France. All the money Monaco was collecting, all the taxes Monaco was collecting, you know, from uh, Wagabel Monton. Soon after the casino was built, a lot of rich people uh, started to come to uh, the casino to, you know, to, uh, to gamble. Knowing that a lot of people at that time uh, were spending, you know, three a month oh, yeah, in the yeah, winter yeah. time, uh, and uh, that the, those people were very rich, they uh, needed not to, uh, to work. So when you when you don't work, most of the time you feel bored. Well, it was so they say. So, uh, so they uh, they knew it would be uh, an excellent way to entertain them and at the same time to uh, to make them spend money. I told you before, most of the poor people in Monaco they live on the water. Okay, they are boat people. They live in the ports. of Saint de Volta, the patron saint of Monaco, which is Monaco and Monte Carlo. So the uh, the ravine here, the entrance to the train station. The train station belongs in the same time to Monaco and France. So the station is in Monaco, the tracks are French. Now we're going to step in the best hey, look, park and we my name. need to go up, all the way up to the casino. <laughs> uh, the battle will be at 5.15. And the name of the boat. What was it? Princess. Oh, it's a bit funny that you want to I don't like the boat. Oh, look at that one. Oh, Nautilus, that was beautiful. Lady now to the left you can uh, see a very common place car here in Monaco. So many sailboats on the island. Most of them stick there. Wow. This is the new yacht club of Monte Carlo. Wow. This is in the shape of a steamer. Wow. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. So this is the Grand Prix town. But cars, they drive in the opposite direction. Well, they come from... from uh, from the end of uh, the town towards us. We're going to stop now in the bus park, just uh, under oh, the gas Linda. station. Linda, yeah. I remember driving And the bus will be at 5.15. Okay, 5.15. No. We're going to stay we drive in here this. half an hour. Okay. So here on the map, if you 
like to have a look there, you get a little bit of an idea where all over the world which flowers are growing and where we buy the essences from. Because we don't produce them ourselves anymore, we buy them from other countries. Does synthetic affect the quality of the oil? Pardon me? Being synthetic, does it affect the quality of the oil? Uh, not necessarily, no. It depends how it is made. So sometimes, even though it is synthetical, it is natural because we use the molecules from other plants. Okay, we will go with the production now. What you say, she uses the molecules from other plants. So that's a little Yes, please. I'll let you smell one. That's it. If you like to hand it on. Wow. Uh, the, the essences are very intense. So sometimes for our noses it, it can be a little bit stronger. It makes the mix shock. It makes an illusion that we have a nice perfume coming out of it. If you like to go a little bit further so everybody fits in, please. If you like to move a little bit further, please. <laughs> In this room, it's the fillings of the perfumes, the real perfumes for the ladies. We have another factory at the entrance of Grass where we produce body toilets and in Ace Village cosmetic products. Actually, what is the difference between perfume, eau de parfum, eau de toilette, and eau de cologne? Four category, everything smells nicely. What's the difference? You know? Of course you do know. You know what O means, right? O is the French word for water. So whenever we have that little word O on the package, it's also in the package. It's a mixture with water. An eau de toilet, for example, has 10% of essences, 10% of water, the rest is alcohol. Whereas a real perfume consists of 24% of essences and no water, 76% of alcohol. So perfume is much more concentrated and of course a little bit more expensive. And what we have in between those two, what, what we very often buy as a perfume, it's the eau de parfum. But there are still 5% of water in an eau de parfum. Okay? So as I said here, it's the fillings of the perfume. Well, here on this place, we still fill by hand. That's so for little extra fillings. Otherwise, we have this half, half automatic machinery here. That means we put the flacons here, then they go into the filling. That is done by a computer. After we'll seal the lady, she will put on all sprays by hand. She ensures everything is all right. You can always open our flacons. You can refill them as you like. After that, the lady will see at the end the control, which is also done by hand. We still have a lot of heavy work here in our little company. We are a family business. This business was founded in 1926 by Mr. Eugen Brooks, not by Mr. Fratana. The name Fratana, it comes from a painter, a very famous painter from Grasse, Jean Honoré Fratana, and in order to honor him, Mr. Brooks named the perfumery of the but they are not connected. And until the day, it's still the same family who leads the company. It's the first generation now, and they like to keep it like it was, with lots of help. Nice things. Okay. Whenever you see those gold and aluminum flacons in our shop, that's for the real perfume for the ladies. The advantage, your perfume is safe from the sunlight, so you can keep it more than six years. If you've got a glass flacon at home, I'll give you two years. Your perfume will change in color, but also in smell. You want to change, better put it in the cupboard. Okay. So we ladies, we can choose whether we take a perfume on eau de toilette, eau de parfum. Gentlemen cannot. For gentlemen, it is just the eau de toilette, no perfume. Right, that's good, so. Okay, you can, can you, can, is it safe to put your perfume in your mouth, or only on the skin? Uh, you should not drink it. There is a lot of alcohol in there. I mean, it's not poisonous, but uh, it is very strong in alcohol. You should not drink Especially it. Especially alcohol. No. <laughs> no alcohol. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay, let's go back to the water and 80% of alcohol. A real perfume consists of 24% of essences and 76% of alcohol. So it is much more concentrated. What's the difference between... Eau de parfum has 15% of essences and 5% of water, the rest is alcohol, 
And an eau de Cologne, it's the weakest one. It has only 5% of essences and 15% of water. Okay? The, the, the difference yes. between the essence and an oil and the essential oil, what's the difference? That is the, the difference is for, for the production. When we do the distillation, we get essential oils. When we do, I will explain that later on, another technique, we will get essences. Mm -hmm. huh? So uh, that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. huh? So you'll show us later. I will show oh, you good. just next Thank door you. another technique to extract those smells. Huh? So there are different possibilities. Mm -hmm. So here in this room, it's the, it's the filling. So now it's a, we prepare our perfumes, which means we put everything in these containers. Well, there is one. Here we have a, a perfume, for example, which is called the Belle de Nuit. In a perfume, it's 24% of essences. I told you that. And that mixture of essences, of course, that is strictly confidential. It's our little secrets. Mm -hmm. So that will be prepared in our big laboratory in the other factory. We put a mixture in there, we add alcohol, we stir, and then we let it stay for at least three weeks. So a perfume has to develop, and what happens? There are still some little bits and pieces, the rest from the plants. They will settle down during that time, and that's why we fill it again. The smaller quantities, we filter still by hand here. It, well, it works like a coffee filter before we bake. The bigger quantities, we filter over there on the civil machine. There we can fill about 600 liter per hour. Okay. And from here on, we will take it next door for the Felix. Next door, I will explain it here. the cold extraction of the essence. A very old technique which we did here in our house until the middle of the 60s. And it was used for flowers like jasmine flowers or tuberose, all those flowers which are very fragile. So therefore we have put on a thin layer of fat on the window panel. It was a mixture of pork and beef fat. The flowers were placed into the fat and the fat would absorb those oily smelling parts. It was a very time-consuming procedure because we had to change the flowers every day for one month. Each morning, throwing out the old ones, putting fresh ones in. So at the end of the month, we, would, we took off the fat, we washed it with alcohol in little machines, which are called batteuses, so that the smell went over from the fat to the alcohol. Afterwards, we could eliminate the fat, evaporate the alcohol, and which was left was the pure essence. Huh? You have smelled one over there, the citronelle, uh, something which is very strong, very intense, and also very expensive. Mm -hmm. I would like to give you an idea of how many flowers we leave of a, for a little bit of essence. Jasmine flowers, for example, they are picked by hand, even today. A picker picks about two to three kilos of flowers a day. That might not sound a lot, but it is because they weigh nothing. And we need one ton of flowers for one kilo of essence. I suppose that explains a little bit the price. Jasmine essences, they can reach prices up to 38,000 euros for one kilo of essence. I mean, that is a lot of money. The enfleurage, as I explained it now, we do not use nowadays anymore. It is, well, it costs a lot of money to pay all those people putting flowers into fat. Huh? So nowadays we have a solution, it's called hexane. The flowers are washed with the solution to extract those little oily parts and it is much faster than the old way. And so it shortens the whole press process to three days. However, the amount of flowers, that hasn't changed, unfortunately. Guys, it's still the eggs. So here we are in our little soap factory. We produce about a thousand of these egg soaps here a day. And they come in six different smells, fragrances, it's all flowers from these areas, like uh, rose, lavender, mimosa. So therefore we buy those soap pellets, we put them in the mixer over there, we add 3% of the smell and a natural coloring. Essences are more or less colorless. We mix that, afterwards it puts here in the first machine in the grinder, and what we receive, it's like these soap flakes. To ensure the coloring, the flavoring is well mixed. Those flakes, they will go in here. They are heated up and pressed. 
and then out comes the soap sausage. <laughs> it is cut <laughs> into pieces and then put under the press to give it the final shape of the egg. It's also a lot of handwork for such a little bar of soap. In our other factories, we also do different shapes. Here in our main house, it's just the egg. Yolk. It's quite a cute idea for a present. <laughs> Here? Not yet? Everybody in? Okay. <laughs> I need a letter. <laughs> no. Okay, just tell me what you think. You're smelling. Would you like to hand it on so everybody gets one? That's what my wife says. Too much information, Alan. He doesn't listen this place, it was not very easy. And then he agreed that the army of Napoleon had to make that hole over there to get through. They mainly constructed this street. It's going to be a hole in one. Welcome to a young living adventure. The bus driver says the hole is not big enough. We have to work on it. How did you guys fall on your will? We signed a waiver. Yes, we do. I had already left the waiver. Tiffany wouldn't let us on unless we all signed it. This, that's the first time ever on any diamonds trip. So now I'm scared. Oh, this this one is yeah. here. <laughs> 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 you got to be joking. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I hope one more of the video. I'm not really thinking of the monsters anymore. No, <laughs> no OH&S over here. <laughs> yes, thank you. And if we're not looking at we'll have none. Yeah. Well, it is. It's just a matter of what we're thinking on about it. It's called diversion tactics. Oh, hello. 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 This is Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Clear <laughs> seat belts. Is that a children's book? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's also a little ride. Too. A ride in. Yeah. Like Disney. Oh, yeah. Disney. So, are you all happy with this? Yeah. <laughs> 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 He's wearing the sweater. <laughs> oh, we got the lip sweater on. We <laughs> signed the lips. <laughs> what? So we signed a waiver. <laughs> <laughs> now, now we're into the team. This is, this this is, is the awesome outfit. This, hey? this is team building. Team building 101. Yeah. <laughs> Those who almost died together lived together better. <laughs> <laughs> is that what that is? <laughs> we will, Gary will find some way to bond us all. <laughs> <laughs> the ones he can't get on the harvest. Yeah, yeah. Do you know the next week a bus went off the cliff? Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> Do you remember in the middle of the night everybody going out on the road to squat? <laughs> Just because we had to tell the bus driver that we're getting our tips ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make, oh, we got a warning here. We got a 50 kilometer speed limit on this one. The road narrows. Oh, it disappears. Does it snow in winter here? She's not looking at me. Is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> 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 Stanley, and that is my Jacob, not Jacob Carson, who's looking to the center island, out the window. Oh, and I'm blocking here. <laughs> so in other words, my source of security in my life, <laughs> my lifeline. Dad's doing that, not me, that's not me, that's uh, Come on, that's every woman's trying to get a hand up my pants. Jerry's hands, I know. <laughs> All you women are the same. And isn't he talking out of the back end right now with that sweater on? <laughs> hey, you are call you me blowing you, smoke? Don't, don't call me hot lips for nothing. 
I didn't know they called you that. Oh yes, they call me a lot of things. I was called other things at school. I should not remember what that was. What did she need? She need a No, she doesn't know how to reverse. Oops, she has wrong way. No idea. Huh? Oh, the bathroom. Yes, oh, we can oh, use our oil. Oh, no, we yeah. have our oil. We, we yeah. use our oil. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do that. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. We're safe. We're just letting you know we took care of it. Yeah, verification. Just letting you know we took care of it. He was going to give us a perfume spray for the bathroom. Oh, he said we took care of it, right? We said we Thank you. Okay. Go to scan you. Sweden, hey? Sweden, coffee. Sweden, yeah, yeah, beautiful. No, number one, brot, broto. <laughs> hey, you got some? Oh, good, we, we stirred up. Oh, boy. And it was 110 degrees out, and we got out to the runway, and we had mechanical problems. So we're sitting on the runway, and there's a man in first class. I was in the what has been accomplished here is, is really something. Yeah, this is a landmark. This is really the place where Gary first came in February 1991, in the middle of the winter. And it was it used to be the first distillery of Marcel. Hello. And, ah, <laughs> and that's Marcel's son. <laughs> oh, you don't. <laughs> okay, anyway, used to be a small distillery with two times 6,000 liters. To give you an example, the one you're going to see that we are using now are 15,000 liters, more than double. But it used to be done all by hand, you know, and he was getting the plants after distillation for burning the fire and make the steam. Thing, so he could make drawing and reproduce a, a, a large distillery, his first large distillery in St. Mary's, uh, one year later. And when Marcel came to visit Gary, uh, I think it was 93 or 94. 2002. Oh, 2002, 2002. that late. Yeah. 2002. When he saw all that Gary did in Mona, I think you already we, had about we, 10, yeah. 10 vats. We took him to St. Mary's too. Uh, we, we, we took him also. But he said the master, being um, Marcel, has been. What do you say in English? Uh, I mean, the, 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 the student. Yeah, be, 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 became the student because what guy did, he he did better. The, I mean, we we can talk about it, but the way the flow of, of of the steam going through was much more better, efficient than it used to be done here. But don't forget, he had to start from here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the fun thing to me, when I first met Gary, he was dressed like a cowboy, like he still is. <laughs> and this place became a restaurant, a country cowboy place. They serve black beans and, and cowboy food. And I used to call Gary the lavender cowboy, so it's perfect now. <laughs> So I'm sorry it's not open, it's just open for, for lunch, but when you come back with all your groups, you know, this is a, a place to stop. Maybe we should put a sign here, you know, yeah. that's where it all started. It's a place to stop because it's really important for us, you know, that's really where we first got together, worked together, and Gary was from 6 in the morning until midnight sometimes, just working, you know, for a couple of weeks and coming back home to massage my son's feet who was six months old. Jeez. So that was very important, you know, for, for us. And 
It's been a long time since we have been here together with Gary. Very long, long time. So if you want, you could walk down. You will see the creek where we used to throw the floral water, the lavender floral water in. So all the trouts were, after fishing, were already, you know, full, relaxed and full of, of lavender smell. So we... We have been. Then we had we had to add a cooling system because we were rejecting kind of hot water that was not good for the creek. But the creek is still there. The platform where we used to work out is still there. So if you want to walk down, but since we are running a little bit late, I would say five minutes. Walk quickly. Put this around your shoulder. Try that. Oh, Gary is gonna talk. See if that helps. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah. Yes. Does that, can you hear back there? Yeah. Were you able to hear Jean Noel? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Because I can have him repeat himself. <laughs> but yeah, as Jean Noel said, it's been a number of years since we've come come back here because once the distillery, when Marcel closed the distillery and retired, and and uh, as I mentioned on our bus, he called me and asked me if I wanted to buy the distillery, uh, which I didn't simply because it was not a stainless steel distillery. It was just an old carbon steel. But yeah, it's a, a lot of memories. <clears throat> A lot of hours I spent here, uh, mostly at night, uh, because my job was feeding the firebox and keeping the fire going. And when I first started, we were distilling uh, cypress, which distilled for uh, 26 hours. And so I would sleep in the distillery on a little cot uh, and get up every two hours and refill the firebox. And a lot of the things that we burned uh, were not environmentally friendly, like tires <laughs> and old railroad ties and anything that would make a hot fire for the, the boiler to produce the steam. Uh, but this is where I got my education in conifer distillation doing the cypress uh, that helped me to be able to distill the balsam at home and start there. And then of course in the summer months we did the uh, lavender, sometimes some rosemary, but lavender was a big crop. and. Uh, the last time this still operated here was in 1994. Um, I believe it was it was still operating, Mary, when I brought you, wasn't it? Yeah. So maybe it was 96 when they closed. Uh, is that better? Oh my goodness, that's a lot better. Technology. So, I just uh, maybe asked Sean Noel. Well, was it 96 it closed? No, he was just telling me 93. 93 it closed. So two years I spent here, and then uh, in that meantime, as I mentioned, coming through uh, the valley, St. Uh, Vincent, that's where up on the mountain is where Mr. View lived, and I spent a lot of time up there with him, and we did a lot of wild crafting on the hills. And as we were coming through the valley, I don't know how many of you noticed, and saw the wild lavender growing along the hills there. But uh, 25 years ago, that entire valley was almost 100% lavender. Uh, when I brought Mary in 94, uh, it was about 80% of it was, oh, it wasn't that, probably about 65, 70% was in lavender then. Now it's 100% gone. There's, as you saw, a few little fields of lavender in, but there was no lavender in that valley, and it was, Coming back, Some, somewhat uh, <clears throat> Why did they stop difficult to drive through there and see see it gone, but only because of the virus that came into France 30 years ago that started and just slowly migrated through all the mountains and valleys and and the villages and until it just killed out the lavender. Uh, why did it kill the lavender? Simply because of uh, over 100 years of using different fertilizers and, and things on the land that weakened it, which weakened the immune system in the plants. 
uh, and Mother Nature took it out because it was weak and it was, uh, you know, uh, a, a lesser quality than what Mother Nature would have created. Because all the wild lavender up in the mountains still exists. The virus couldn't kill it. So that alone should have been should have been a, uh, an awakening call to the people that they needed to go back to nature, they needed to go back to uh, organic type of work to preserve that which did exist, but it's gone. And unfortunately, most of the people here will not ever go back to lavender again, will they, John Well, You think so? Some will? Uh, we have a little bet place because I don't think they will. Um, and they, they have to, so you mean. Yeah, well, that's a good point. But, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But the reason I feel that way is simply because when farmers get burned, uh, they generally only get burned once, and they don't go back. And that was their thing, is they invested a lot. They know it takes a lot to, to get lavender growing, and it takes a lot of money and a lot of time. Even though here the government now is offering to subsidize them to encourage more growers to start, there will be some, but I personally don't believe we'll ever see the valleys uh, full of lavender like we did 25 years ago. But uh, up on the plateau, you're going to see a lot more, and it'll be a lot more exciting. So without that, I don't want to take more time, because some of you, yes, please do walk down to the creek, and uh, you'll see the old platforms and the areas where we were. Um, enjoy, and then it's back on the bus, and we're going to head to Simeon. As we go up over the mountain, we'll start hitting the top of the plateau. We'll start seeing some of the fields, and we might stop going over just over the summit where we get some nice pictures. Uh, John Noel just told me that my mom is coming. <laughs> This beautiful lady, as I said, is my second mom. This is Marcel's wife, Marta, and she's the one that would take care of me while I was here and feed me and make sure I ate. And <laughs> Wash my clothes, iron my clothes. <laughs> it was my mom. <laughs> Always young looking. Superb. You are around 50 years old, aren't you? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, he's, he's coming to see you. And she's here. That's stressful for her. Uh, did you, Mary, come to the distillery uh, later on? 94. Oh, in 94. On Capo and Capo. No, no, no. Uh, 94. <laughs> so many, so many years have passed. Uh, she still has the souvenir of Mona Farm when they when they went there with with Marcel, and she said that was super, absolutely. She should see how it looks now. She has no idea. Yeah, it was a long, long time ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's not good to make surprises to Gary, especially when we are already late. Huh? Let me tell you, you're gonna you're gonna be reaching your bed around 2 a.m. That's usually 
pretty good time. Yeah, that, that's, that's normal when, when we're here in the mountains to work. So. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> He's going to have to back right up. Part of the video, this one. Yeah? Oh, that was in Melbourne. <laughs> in, in their motorhome, remember? Oh, another one. Oh, and another one. This is the, this is a the missile. They're firing at us. Oh, you love the adaptation. Mm -hmm. At least the road here is wider. Yeah. wanting us to go down? He's I was 100% purple and in three years it will be that way again because of Young Living. All these farmers on this plateau are coming back to Young Living to start growing for us again. France's production is 80 ton of lavender. This year we will be buying 45 ton. And next year, within a year to two years, we'll be buying 100% of all lavender produced in all of France. Wow. I didn't say, I didn't know that. And this has been no, 23 it's years of developing the relationships, working with the people who are now, when I ask them to grow, they grow. Hmm. What were the first statistics you said on the field? Yeah, the 45 tons. Oh, the total production in France today is 80 tons. And this year we'll be buying 40 ton. So uh, next year, 65 to 80 ton. So we're most of the farmers that have taken the lavender out now have agreed this year, and we already have some that have started this year replanting and putting it back in. And a big, actually, I probably should use the. What do you mean by buying? Yeah. What do you mean by buying? Ah, oh, uh, there we go. Use this for the moment. I'm trying to get this one to work again. <laughs> Maybe just put that on your yeah. As you look out over the valley, 20 years ago it was entirely purple. Even where we're standing right here was a lavender field. In fact, I brought Mary here on her honeymoon to shore. Uh, I don't know how many of you ladies and husbands have taken your farming on your honeymoon. <laughs> but when I made it through my honeymoon, I realized she'd probably stick with me because it was all about fields and farming. It wasn't about uh, being a tourist in the city. In fact, we walked along this road here, holding hands and gazing over the valley and gathering seed from the wild lavender growing along at the edge of the, the road and in the trees. And that was also planted in, in St. Mary's. Is that what went home in oh your boots? my goodness. Pardon? Is that the ones that went home in your boots? Yeah. <laughs> they went home in my boots. Oh, there's a 25 years of history in this country for me. And, and John Noel, it's been, it's been an amazing journey together. And had it not been for John Noel, I would not have had the doors open to me and the opportunities that uh, came my way that provided what we have today in Young Living. It gives me a great deal of 
of honor and joy to know that in my work now we have been able to return back to France their culture of lavender because it was it was dying and as it was not for young living it would be dead and it would all be gone when we planted the St. Mary's lavender and when it grew and bloomed this year and all of these people here in Provence saw it it reestablished in them the hope that it could come back again and be what it used to be as Benoit said 50 years ago he looked at standing in our field and it is recorded he and I and Jean Noel and Jean Marie were standing in my field and he said as he hugged me he said Gary this is how our lavender looked 50 years ago and it was an emotional uh, moment so it's, it's great to know that we're returning that to these people and my time here has built the confidence and, and the faith in them that they're willing to go back and farm lavender again for Young Living. The field is directly in front of us where they're harvesting and harvesting for Young Living, but a real drive and you'll see several of our fields, our co-op growers, as harvesting as we go down off the plateau. I'm, I'm really happy that you're going to be able to see that because it is past time for harvesting. But because it's been a cool winter or cool summer and rains that are abnormal, it has delayed the harvest two to three weeks. Uh, it delayed our harvest at home two weeks. So we've had the same thing there. But it is, it is very, very exciting. France's production this year is 80 ton of lavender, or will be when they finish up. Uh, Young Living will be buying 30 to 40 ton of that this year, uh, upwards of 45 ton next year, 65 to 80 ton. So if the farmers didn't grow here for us, we wouldn't have the oils that we need. And it's, it's a great joy to me to know that we're helping to reestablish that. And that was it. Spider? Um, this, this little mountain stop right here is very special to me because uh, it was one of our honeymoon stops and I've been here many times over the, the years prior to that and so I brought Mary here and I just want you to know that you're that special to me. So I wanted you to be able to see the Provence Plateau of Lavender from here and uh, when we when you come back again each year you're going to see more and more lavender fields as it's being taken out of different crops now and return back to lavender for young living. So it's been uh, a great journey that in many ways is just beginning again. So uh, thank you. Take thank pictures you. quickly and uh, we'll get you back on the on the buses. We've got a lot to do. Thank you. Hmm? No, we got one. This? No, it's not on. <laughs> Forget that. They're harvesting here. Is it working now? Is it working? Yes. Okay. If you want to get off and take some pictures, also the field to the left is where they lay the lavender to let it dry for two or three days, and up to seven days, depending on the conditions, before it's picked up and taken to the distillery. So if you want to get some pictures, here's the place to do it because it, they will not be harvesting down in the valley. It's already done. Okay. Okay.
ago, but it wasn't simply because it wouldn't quit raining. And even today it was questionable because it was so wet from the rain last night. And the uh, einkorn has gone into maturity where it's almost threshing itself the moment you throw it into the header on the machine. The kernels just drop right off on the header. So it's just one of those things that farmers deal with is weather. Now right behind you is the St. Mary's Lavender. And if you look across the field to your right, you'll notice there's a change in the rows. The rows to the right, that you see no flowers in the world, that is the French Lavender. So it's in training, trying to learn to become St. Mary's Lavender. And all the flowers you see are second bloom flowers on the St. Mary's Lavender. These are the ones, if you go into the field and you're gentle, you can cut them and make yourself a little bouquet of theirs to take home. So you can see the difference in the St. Mary's Lavender versus the French Lavender. And you see a difference in the health of it, the brightness of it, the strength of it. It's just remarkable. So it's a really a rare opportunity. Nowhere except here is the French Lavender and St. Mary's Idaho Lavender growing side by side. It's pretty stimulating as if you've heard the guys uh, talk about it, how fun it has been, how much hope it's bringing to everyone here in the Simeon Valley in the restoration of French Lavender, of which St. Mary's Lavender and Utah Lavender and Clary Sage and Melissa all originated from here. So, from 1989, 1980, actually 1986, I started getting to go back to the seed when I'd come to France and take it back. And it wasn't until 1989 that I actually planted the first uh, lavender in Spokane in my little garden plot there and started growing the starts in the greenhouse that went into St. Mary's in 1992. So it's been a long period of evolution. Many years. It's probably, uh, I'm going to guess, between a 1915 and 1920 model. Uh, very very much like mine at home. It's a smaller model, it's a five foot cut. Uh, the ones I have at home are seven and a half foot cut. You know, in the United States they always make things bigger. So, but it runs very well. I see them operating it. The thing runs extremely well. The water is a little bit sticky. There's just a few bundles in the tying, but not that many. Uh, it's just a matter of working it a little more and getting bite it, it will be soft. And that's what we call the soft dough stage. You bite it and it'll actually be almost a, a creamy liquid that will come out of the kernel because it hasn't fully matured. If it's liquidy, then it's too early to cut. When you bite it, you want it to come out to where it's a thick, almost a thick paste. And that's the right time for harvesting because uh, wheat crops, cereal crops of all kinds are similar to what I talked about with the lavender and other crops. They go through a cycle and during the cycle of the kernel when it's going from a soft dough stage to a hard dough stage is when the enzymes are the most active. So when it's cut in the soft dough stage and then it's shocked in the field and stood like you saw here a few bundles that were put together then as the moisture comes on and, and dries off from the sun over seven to ten days, then that kernel matures into the hard dough stage, which is a hard kernel. If you, and, and please do, uh, get some kernels and bite them, get them out of the husk. Uh, actually, Jean Noel, if you could grab me a, a hand, everyone. It goes to this stage here where it's already in the hard dough stage. The kernel is already through the enzymatic process. So the enzymes then retreat back to prepare for the decay. It's just like we humans, we go through that stage of infantile, juvenile, adult tile, and old tile. And that's when we start getting old and brittle. 
is the old tile stage. So it's the same thing. Our enzymes start decreasing in activity. Our hormones start decreasing in activity. And this is exactly what takes place with the grains. And that's why it's so important to cut it in that soft dose stage and then and let it mature through the enzyme trans transfer stage. That's when it becomes the most digestible. This year here, there was no option because it never quit raining long enough that they could get in the field and cut it in the soft dough stage. So it's like everything else. You harvest it when Mother Nature allows you to harvest it to capture the best you can capture from it. For thousands of years. Yeah, and he, you know, I think you met what a year and a half, two years ago with the Bombay. And uh, until now, it was like a poor man's crop, you know, local, local people were using it. And I would say for the last five, six years, the health food industry started to be interested in the nutritional value of it. But it was not really going fast. I'm not translating, I'm giving you more information. But then I'm translating, he said, and he really wants to thank Gary because he's really pushing the information about this particular plant around the world so fast that uh, it's very, he's very appreciative about that. Yeah, in order to really see the, the quality of the product, just use it. And I will add that any recipe where you use rice, you could use the, the kernel, you know, instead of rice. We also call it the Provençal rice, this uh, uh, I'm called. Because, no, but that means uh, it's used in, in many, many preparations locally, you know. And to add something, it's been cultivated in this area for over 7,000 years, non-stop. Interesting. Okay, any questions for Blondie or Jean Noel on einkorn? When he says the einkorn can be eaten, he's talking about it being hulled, like taking Yeah, hull it and, and you can it. eat it with the hull on because it's good fiber. Right. <laughs> yeah. So Jean Noel and I do have some interesting products that we're going to be evolving with. Uh, one of the things that I really, really impressed with, and that is the husk off from the einkorn because it's got a, a texture to it that I really, really like, uh, as well as a nutrient factor that has not been explored yet. And uh, if Mary were standing here listening, which and since she's not, she's not paying a lick of attention, I can just talk all I want. <laughs> so I'm gonna just tell you what I'm gonna be evolving in the next couple of years, and that's gonna be Einkorn ICP. Because I, I feel extremely uh, good about it. I like it. John Noel's made some einkorn husk pillows. It's really fascinating. He's mixed them with uh, lavender flowers. Uh, and it, it's amazing. But the husk is so light and fibrous, but it's, a, it's got a gentle softness when it goes through the, the milling machine. So we've got some uh, at home now that we're starting, I'm starting to experiment with. A lot of amazing things. And I have some very exciting things I'm working on right now at home. Um, but I've got to keep that a secret until we get it patented. Mm -hmm. And you'll know about it by convention next year. Okay, so a lot of these. Anything else? Okay, uh, we got plastic. Because all of us have been communicating with each other on the fact that as we have these pancake brunches and stuff with your syrup as well, it's really honestly a huge hit. Like sometimes we try to placate you and say, oh Gary, we love the chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> but this is really <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and the syrup. <laughs> Don't forget the syrup. Don't forget the syrup. And the spaghetti.
How are the spaghetti? So we call it the Ancorn fan cake, huh? <laughs> Children, I know you're excited. Thank you. The nutritional profile of the einkorn is almost almost identical to the wolfberry. Mm. It is so similar that it's astounding. Wow. Uh, the protein content we'll of the einkorn versus durum, <laughs> hard durum wheat is about mm. two and a half times greater. Uh, higher in vitamin C by two to three times. Uh, higher in vitamin B by almost two times. And antioxidant-wise, it's almost nine times higher. So the einkorn could be a food, a staple food that would satisfy the RDA needs of the human body almost by itself. And when we go back and we look at history, which, you know, we kind of have to guess at a lot of it because it's pretty poorly documented, but there were people and tribes in that that lived on einkorn through the winter months that, from storage, uh, and that's pretty much all they ate with a little meat, and that was it. So you take the Ninja Red and you supplement your einkorn with it, and you could live totally on Ninja Red and einkorn and never have to eat again from McDonald's. No, I'll keep the chocolate coming. So now that Jerry has told me that my chocolate is not so good. That's great. Oh, the years ago chocolate. Years ago chocolate. Oh, I liked it better. No. Keep the chocolate. <laughs> okay, any other questions? We're going. Woo! Okay, it looks like you're not going to... You're going to need a bath to be humble. You're perfect in every way. Taste kind. And I get that look in my way. You know. Be humble, I'm doing the best that I can. 